Namaste. So, I have to make one more video because in all of the details getting into eternalism and timelessness and the differences and all of this, I neglected to mention one very important point. And to lead up to it, I want to go back and take a look at the six qualities of the Dhamma. There are these six qualities of this Dhamma. Svakato, it is well preached. Sandittiko, it can be seen here and now. Akaliko, it is immediate and timeless. Ehipasiko, it invites one to come and see. Opanayiko, it leads one on. And Pachatang Veritabo Vinyuhi, it can be realized directly by the wise, each one for himself. Now, we already went over or went deep into Akaliko. But what about visible in the here and now? What does that mean, really? It means the Buddha's Dhamma, the Buddha's teaching, is verifiable. You can see it. You can experience it right here and now. And that means a great difference between timelessness and eternality. Because eternality, as we said, often gives rise to dogmatism. And dogmatism says, you have to believe this, and there's no proof, but that's okay. <laughs> because we all believe this, and it's supported by so many arguments and reason and scriptures and blah, 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 blah. Well, I don't buy it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't buy it. And the reason I don't buy it is because the Buddha's teaching is verifiable. I mean, we live in an age of scientific experimentation uh, where everything is supposed to be experimentally verified. Well, what about these, all these spiritual teachings? Can they be verified? Most of them can. But that's the advantage of the timelessness of the here and now aspect of the Buddha's teaching. You can verify everything in your own experience. Let's just go over a few points and compare. For example, eternalism asserts that it's forever in the past and future. Can that be verified? How? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. How can anybody verify that something is going to exist forever in the past and forever in the future? It can't be verified. Sorry. Fail. <laughs> but timelessness says it's always here and now. And that can certainly be verified by anyone who cares to look into it. There's no problem. Just do the process that the Buddha gives. The Eightfold Noble Path. The Four Noble Truths. The Paticca Samuppada, which we're going to cover in detail in the next series. Or take any of the suttas that we've talked about, like the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. And just look into yourself, look into your own mind, and watch it happening in real time. That's verification. Yes, check. <laughs> Then, eternalism usually teaches that there was a creation in the beginning of the world. The Vedas, the Bible, the Koran, the Talmud, they all teach about creation and the Creator. Can that be verified? No way. There's no way to go back to the beginning and verify it. And there's no other universe that we can watch being created and verify it that way. So forget it, it can't be verified. But the Buddha teaches that the world always just exists. That can be certainly verified just by observation. It's true on the face of it. 
It doesn't require any evidence. Huh? The world always just exists. No need to get into complicated arguments about speculative things like creation that are completely unverifiable and just a matter of faith. Huh? And anyway, what bearing does it have on our ultimate enlightenment? So creationism, eternalism, dogmatism introduce so many so-called facts that are unverifiable and actually have nothing to do with self-realization. Let's go on. Eternalism says that consciousness is a phenomenon that arises in the world. Is that verifiable? No. Read anything on so-called the hard problem. Uh, the hard problem is exactly this. Prove that consciousness arises as a phenomenon in the material world. It can't be done. And the reason, of course, is that consciousness is transcendental. <laughs> it transcends the world because it's based in unconditioned awareness. And unconditioned awareness is completely uh, unexperienceable for someone in conditioned consciousness. Huh? What to speak of these scientists who want to verify everything by some kind of instrument. So it can't be proved. But the world as a phenomenon in consciousness is easy to prove. The world appears when you wake up in the morning. It disappears when you go to sleep at night. That's the proof. The world arises as a phenomenon in consciousness when consciousness enters the jagrat state. When consciousness leaves that jagrat state and goes into another state, svapna or sushupta, the world disappears. So the world is a phenomenon. Check. Then there's the matter of eternal identity, the soul. Can you prove it? Can you show me your soul? Can you demonstrate the soul in real time? No. Nobody ever has and nobody ever will. Because the whole idea of a soul is simply imagination. It's a nice idea. huh? I'm going to exist forever in some form or other. My consciousness may transmigrate from one body to another, but I as a being, will continue to exist. No. <laughs> Can't be proven. Can you prove that you, for example, are the being, the same being that existed in some previous life? No, you can't prove it. Although there are stories of people who remembered their previous lives and there was some proof and stuff like that. That's still not proof of the existence of a soul. What if it's just some information transfer or something like that? Huh? That's not sufficient proof to prove the existence of an eternal soul. However, the teaching of the Buddha, no self, is easy to prove. Just go looking for yourself. Huh? Go look for your ego or your mind or your soul or any of those things. You can't find them. You know that famous story about Bodhidharma and the Chinese emperor? Huh? He had the Chinese emperor go look for his mind. And after looking for several hours, he realized there is no mind. No mind, no self, no soul, no person. Everything is just an agglomeration, an aggregate, a combination of different phenomena that we group together under a certain name. That's all. The name is not the thing. So when we start to speculate about the name, oh, this name exists forever. No, it doesn't. No name ever exists forever. No name actually exists at all. It's just a name, a symbol, an abstraction. It doesn't exist. Except as a thought, perhaps. But then what about the soul of the world? 
God, the Creator. It may be called different things, you know, uh, Jehovah, Shiva, Allah, Krishna, uh, so many other things, and all the goddesses and all this other stuff. Imagination that is uh, used in a story to explain the existence of the world. But wait a minute, why do we need a story to explain the existence of the world? Isn't the fact that it exists enough? So the Buddha, the Buddha teaches that the world is actually impersonal nature. It's just there. It just growed. Huh? It, like a weed or like, like the grass in the summertime. When the weather gets warm and it rains, the grass comes up. When it gets dry and hot, then it turns brown. And in the winter, it goes away. It's natural. Nobody has to cause it. It just happens. Because to get into all this reasoning and speculation and logic and arguments about the Creator and how it was created and so on and so forth. Again, what does this have to do with our self-realization? Really nothing. It's none of our business how the world was created. <laughs> our business is to get self-realized and get out of it. So the next thing is, is there life after death or is there nothing? And this is the conflict between eternalism and nihilism. But actually nihilism is a, just a different flavor of eternalism. It's the obverse of eternalism. It's eternalism turned on its head. The eternalists, the religious fanatics say, oh, there's life after death, eternal life, and so on. Whereas the skeptics, the nihilists say, no, there's nothing after death. Both of them are just whistling Dixie. There is absolutely no proof of either of these things. And no proof is possible. Because again, after death is in the future. And the future doesn't exist. The future is just a dream. The past is just a memory. So it's not possible to prove any of this stuff. What does Buddha say? Certain phenomena arise due to a cause, and then they cease and pass away when the cause is removed. And we'll get into this teaching in great depth in the next series. So arising and cessation. This is the middle path. Huh? It's not that everything exists forever, or everybody exists forever, or that after death there's nothing. Huh? Those are two extremes. The Buddha teaches the middle path. Things arise due to a cause. When the cause is removed, they cease. Bas. And finally, eternalism teaches that the world is ultimately real and that the reality of all other phenomena, including the soul, God, everything like that, is derived from the reality of the world. And if you ask them to prove it, they'll trot out so much evidence based on worldly phenomena. But is that proof that they're real? No, because all phenomena have a beginning and an end. And that which has a beginning and an end is only relative existence, is not absolute existence. It can't be used as proof of the reality of the world. Uh, and especially, it can't be proof that the world can serve as a basis of reality for other things. So the Buddha's teaching is that the world isn't real, the void is ultimately real. The void is uncreated, it can't be destroyed, it never changes. There's nothing there, not even space or time. There's no becoming, there's no death. So the void is the ultimate reality and it is the means by which we attain Nibbana. So I just wanted to make these points to really finish up this series. I hope you enjoyed it. I've had fun making it. So 
look forward to the next series on Paticca Samupada, conditional arising or dependent arising or dependent origination. <laughs> Buddha Saranai.